And our next speaker is um, Manuel Weber, who was actually a um, researcher on adrenalist double beta decay experiment, was developing deep neural networks for that experiment, but then switched to industry and continued working on uh, these uh, data science problems. So today he will tell us um, about uh, what he learned from there. Go ahead. Now. Yeah, thanks, Igor. Um, and thanks for inviting me as a speaker. Uh, very honored <laughs> to be back in the this community. Uh, and it's nice to see some uh, familiar faces and hear some familiar voices. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's nice to, to hear about what's going on in the uh, dark matter and neutrino physics uh, area, and especially in machine learning. Um, <clears throat> since, yeah, I've been working in this uh, area for many, many years. And then as Igor pointed out, I've transitioned uh, to industry since. Um, I was lucky enough to have found a very, very interesting company to work at, at and um, I'm still able to do um, research uh, uh, in a slightly different area, but uh, still very interesting. And um, so this company is called Descartes Labs. Um, and uh, so I'm an applied scientist there in the uh, computer vision and uh, machine learning team. Um, and uh, so this talk is just going to be about uh, some things that I've been working on, some things that I've learned from the industry perspective um, that may also, um, you know, uh, help to advance some of the techniques that are used in uh, particle physics as well. And uh, just a heads up, this talk is going to be slightly different from uh, the things that you've heard so far, probably. Uh, as I'm not going to show you some new physics results, but uh, rather some pretty pictures from space. <laughs> um, so I will first just like give a brief, uh, very brief introduction to what we do at Descartes Labs, uh, what the company is all about. Um, and then I specifically will talk about some of the challenges that we are facing and uh, that are also common to the uh, challenges and issues in, um, uh, in, you know, the physics community when you use uh, machine learning techniques that were developed in different areas. Uh, and then I will give uh, uh, some overview of uh, two research areas that I've been uh, working on um, that kind of address these issues. Um, one is called contrastive sensor fusion and another one, uh, neural architecture search. Uh, and then I will conclude and um, take any questions. Um, so just a, a little bit of information about uh, what we do at Descartes Labs, just to give you some ideas of uh, the kinds of problems that, or challenges that we're dealing with. Um, so on a very high level, Descartes Labs is a geospatial data company. And uh, more uh, specifically, we uh, built a data refinery platform um, that, uh, you know, um, is specifically for this type of data and also gives uh, instant access to science ready data. Um, and so uh, the problems that we are facing here is, uh, are very similar to like some, um, you know, physics experiments such as uh, collider experiments where you have lots of data coming in and you need to process that data and make it available to users to uh, do analysis with. Um, and so uh, you can imagine uh, geospatial data. Um, so when, what I mean about geospatial data is mostly data that's coming from uh, satellites that or, are orbiting the earth. They're continuously taking measurements, continuously uh, taking pictures with uh, both passive and active sensors, um, sending it down to earth. And then someone stores it on you know, some servers uh, and the different agencies uh, have their own ways of storing the data and makes accessing the data for a scientist or you know, anyone interested in the data very tedious. Uh, the data is unstructured, is raw. Um, and so what the Cart Labs has built is a platform that has uh, inches pipelines in place that uh, continuously uh, collect these kinds of data from publicly available sources um, from you know, many different satellites uh, and then uh, uh, pre-processes it uh, and, um, you know, for geospatial data, the challenge is that um, you, you have many, many satellites taking many, many scenes, um, 
you know, from the same space, uh, from the same place uh, on Earth. But, you know, if you take an image from that uh, sensor and an image from that sensor, they don't necessarily, you know, align and stuff. So you have to um, co-register things to make it actually useful to be able to uh, use uh, multi-band, multi-sensor information. And this is exactly what we provide through a, you know, in the end, it's a Python API that you have access to. Um, so currently we store more than 15 petabytes of data on our platform and uh, we build a very, very fast way to access that data and, um, and then do uh, analysis on it. Um, and in a lot of the cases, this is obviously, you know, because it's, um, it's about images. So it very quickly goes into image analysis, computer vision applications. And I will talk about some of that um, later. Um, so here's kind of uh, an overview of what we do as applied scientists. Um, here are some nice pictures of the Bay Area uh, taken from different satellites or in different bands just to kind of give you an idea of like the types of data that we're, we're dealing with and what you can get out of it. Um, so you see the RGB picture, uh, very specific or very typical for the Bay Area. Now in the summer, you get some fog coming in from the, from the, from the ocean. And then you can look at the same thing in near infrared. You can look at it from a different sensor with um, active like, uh, so this is radar. And then you can um, have derived products uh, such as NDVI, sort of a um, vegetation index giving you, you know, pointing out where there's vegetation. Uh, so we have both the raw data from the satellite, but also provide derived prod, uh, data that we, you know, assemble from the information that's coming from the satellites. Uh, and then applications are very broad. So our team of applied scientists are from uh, many di different areas. We actually have a lot of physicists, um, and but we also have geologists, we have hydrologists, and you know a variety of of experts um, to tackle some very hard problems um, that uh, um, you know you can uh, sort of categorize into into these area. Uh, so agriculture is uh, obviously a very big area uh, where we try to um, well detect. Uh, you know, agriculture fields um, detects the types of crops monitor over time. And then, you know, you can get an idea of the health of crops. Uh, you can, um, you know, predict the yield and, and stuff like that. That was one of the first applications the company actually did. And then we went into more areas like oil and gas, you know, see like methane, um, uh, you know, methane leaks around, you know, well pads and stuff like that. Mining and metals, some satellites are very good for detecting, you know, the types of um, uh, rocks and stuff and, you know, geologists can use that to, um, for mining. Uh, then, you know, there are other things like power renewables, we can detect solar panels, windmills and all that, predict um, power, out, uh, power uh, forecasts and these kind of things. Um, we're also into uh, shipping and logistics, you know, tracking ships on the oceans and stuff like that. Uh, and it, the list goes on and on. And I actually don't want to go into much details because uh, we might run out of time. Um, and so in the end, you know, you, you can use all of that data to then uh, build some analytics on top of that. Um, here are some uh, simple example, you know, just taking that uh, um, radar uh, signal, uh, if you add some temporal information, then you know you, you suddenly get like shipping traffic. Uh, you can then go in and monitor the specific locations and get, get um, you know, some like activity signal that, you know, relates to the economy uh, of shipping. Um, here is a more, uh, uh, here is an example more to, related more to, you know, what I've been, what I'm working on, like in more of the computer vision um, area um, where um, a lot of the times you want to detect things or uh, you want to apply some um, segmentation algorithms um, to classify the types of land uh, mass and stuff like that. So in this case, uh, you know, we just deployed a, a, a neural architecture that uh, detects buildings. Uh, and then, you know, this becomes another data layer uh, that you can use for, for other things. Um, uh, here's an example of uh, agriculture fields. Uh, here, 
you know, we can use an instant segmentation algorithm to detect types of, of, uh, of fields um, and classify the, the type of crop. Uh, then it, again, you can use for downstream tasks uh, to solve uh, some problems. Um, so now I wanna get into a little bit about, you know, the challenges that we are facing when working with uh, geospatial data. And I think this is relating a lot to um, the particle physics uh, problem because oftentimes um, these machine learning or deep learning algorithms have been developed uh, in a very different area. Um, so, and, and you know, the nature of deep learning uh, is such that if you're train something from scratch, you need lots and lots of data, uh, which is not always available. Um, if you take, uh, you know, satellite imagery, there's lots and lots of data, but only a small fraction of it is actually labeled. So to do any supervised tasks, uh, it's actually very challenging. Um, so the best way to, you know, uh, get around that is actually use pre-trained uh, networks, but then pre-trained networks are very good at their very indiv individual tasks and they're mostly uh, trained on natural imagery, which have three band RGB. Um, and this is both uh, in particle, phys particle physics and in our area of geospatial data, um, not really what your, what your data looks like, right? So, um, uh, so in our case, uh, oftentimes we have uh, lots and lots of spectral bands like RGB are among them, but then you have like 20 other bands, right, that uh, you want to use um, that contain lots of information. Uh, and here's kind of like a, uh, an example that shows that. So this is the, this is a, a satellite image from the campfire almost two years ago. Um, and, you know, this is the RGB version of it, but the same satellite also takes thermal images. So if you look at the thermal images, you can actually point out some like you know, hot spots, hot areas, and you can almost see through the clouds. So there's lots of lots of um, valid information there that you want to be using if you were to develop some kind of um, analytics with this with this imagery. Um, also showing here is just the, kind of the capability of the platform um, of like superimposing like derived layers here, like I'm showing like buildings detected um, from different uh, imagery. Um, and so now I'm go, come, going into the uh, sort of researchy areas that I've been working on to um, address these, these issues. Um, and so, so one, one thing uh, is this thing that we call contrastive sensor fusion. Um, and this uh, is trying to uh, exactly address the problem of uh, having, you know, good networks but not necessarily enough data to train them from scratch um, and also uh, not necessarily relying on pre-trained weights uh, for those networks um, because um, the types of imagery that the networks were trained in for um, is very different uh, from you know the satellite imagery that we're dealing with um, and have many many more bands uh, and so what we're trying to do is come up with a uh, method to use the massive amount of data that we have um, to learn better feature res representations um, that can then be used as like baselines for downstream tasks. Um, and one of the key aspects here is that uh, this should be able to use, um, or yeah, should be, should be able to use multiple spectral bands and also be able to fuse sensors uh, across different domains and be uh, able to re, um, produce like representations that are independent of um, what kind of bands or sensors you are using. Um, and, you know, one advantage we have with exactly the platform that I was describing a little bit before is that we have lots and lots of data that look at the same place on earth, but from different views, right? So here's an image of the same thing but taken with uh, two different sensors that have two different resolutions. And then here I'm, I'm showing um, this red because I'm using the near infrared band. Uh, so it's the false color composite. Um, and if you were to feed those images down a, um, 
uh, encoder network, you would expect that the uh, representation that the encoder produces uh, should be very similar because the information contained in, 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 in these three images is essentially the same, but you know, it does look different. Um, and since we have lots and lots of data, so we can produce these kind of tri triplets um, basically uh, you know, for free uh, in a very systematic way. We chose a uh, unsupervised approach to train um, an encoder network that you know, should learn to create a representation that encapsulates all the information contained in the image. And hopefully it will be better than any uh, predate network um, on you know, other data sets such as ImageNet. Uh, so here's kind of the, the setup um, that we built uh, for this problem. Um, so what you have here is two, um, uh, uh, so basically you choose a base network. In, in this case, it's just ResNet 50. Uh, and then you have two views, you build two, two views of the uh, pool of images that you collected. Um, and then you feed it down uh, the two paths. So the two, two networks actually share the weights or it's a Siamese network. Um, and you feed it down the path and code the information in the network. And then you compare the features at various levels or various depth in the network. Uh, and then you, you construct a loss that forces the network to learn a representation that is very similar for similar images and very different for dissimilar images. Um, and as you do that, uh, uh, since we have lots and lots of information and you don't need any labels for it, so you, you're working purely in the feature space. And um, so this is kind of, this is called a contrastive uh, approach. Uh, it's been around for a while, this idea, but it's never really been applied to satellite imagery. It's usually applied to natural images where you try to um, uh, build an encoder network that, for example, in a given image, tries to takes a patch of the image and then tries to predict the neighboring patch. And the idea there is that as long as it's the same image, the information in there should be the same. So you should be able to encode the information from one patch and then predict a neighboring patch, um, you know, given that information. Same thing is uh, applicable to like videos where you uh, encode the information of one frame and predict the, the next frame. Um, or then in, 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 in this environment, you, um, you basically have two patches of the same image that should contain about the same information. And then you compare it to two patches of uh, two different images. So those are all the same ideas, but they all rely on the fact that if you have one image um, basically contain one type of object, and so two different patches should be the same. In a satellite image, two patches can be very, very different and can contain very different images. One could be a you know, football field and one could be a building in the same image, and those should not have contain the same information. Um, and so the construction of the loss um, is, is given here. So this is essentially, uh, is essentially softmax definition where you compare um, two images in, in the batch and essentially maximize their similarity and then minimize the similarity to that same Im of that same image to uh, all the other images in the batch, which are from different views. And uh, so the, the function that you use for, for similarity can be, can be anything. In, in our case, we just use the, um, you know, essentially the distance uh, in feature space. Um, so here's a, a little bit more um, visual on, on how this works. Um, just again, so three different sensors looking at the same uh, spot on Earth. Uh, and then you build a uh, so you take advantage that you can f you can feed through a batch of data, and in the end you can uh, build a similarity of each image to uh, its corresponding uh, uh, second view, um, and then you get a similarity ma matrix, uh, and then basically you just apply um, this this operation. So you take the softmax in both uh, axes, um, which you know just make sure that you, you maximize the 
the similarity between the uh, similar uh, images and, and minimize the uh, similarity between the similar images. And then you do, you, you transpose the whole thing. So, so in, in one direction, it's, it's, it's essentially saying that uh, view one predicts view two, and in the other way, it's view two predicting view one. Um, and then you just take the average of the two. Um, and so in order to make it really hard for the network, uh, you apply lots of data augmentation um, uh, that you feed into the two paths of the network. And um, another key point here is that you uh, randomly drop out channels and randomly drop out sensors so that it, can, it has to learn a representation that doesn't rely on all the 12 channels that you feed it, but can work with a subset of it. So in the end, uh, we yeah we trained this network on on uh, 47 million image triplets, uh, four bands each, so 12 bands in total, um, and we try to use as as a big of a batch size as possible because that makes the loss more accurate. Um, training it on on TPUs, uh, and then we we uh, evaluated the learned uh, representations uh, on a different data set, which is called the OpenStreetMap. That is just a data set of classified pictures that you know contain a specific land uh, mass, such as like you know water or a building or a bridge or something like that. And the hope is that if we use the, uh, the CSF learned representation, uh, of uh, that image because it was trained on on specifically on satellite imagery and not some natural imagery it uh, should be better than the network that was trained on um, on ImageNet for example and this is indeed true so we uh, we take a, a, um, you know an approach to compare the the, the accuracy in a way that um, we basically say for a given data point, you encode it and then you say, um, you know, you, you just like do some PCA to reduce the, the dimensionality and then you take the K nearest neighbors of that point and then you say, what's the fraction of those K nearest neighbors that belong to the same class? And that kind of like gives you an idea of how well the representation um, was able to cr create like clusters in feature space, right? So the better you can separate um, uh, different types of uh, uh, data in, in, in feature space, the better the, rep the learned representation is. And uh, we, we basically show that this is better than ImageNet in all cases. And um, in, in, in addition, you know, because ImageNet is only working on three bands, we can add up to 12 bands. We actually get a, uh, a, a much higher accuracy. And uh, here's another visualization of the, uh, re you know, the learned representations from, with the CSF approach. Um, so you take the, um, you know, some of those PCA features and then uh, reduce the dimensionality further down to two dimensions uh, and then plot it in the TSNI plot. And, uh, you know, you, you can see that, uh, so this is totally unsupervised learning again to mention that. Um, and you can see that it's 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 starting to separate uh, different types of um, of um, you know views or or di different types of objects uh, in satellite imagery. Um, you know it starts to separate those out very well in in feature space. And that's exactly what you want um, to then have like a very uh, you know uh, very stable like uh, pre-trained network that you can then use for downstream tasks. Um, so basically use that as a baseline uh, rather than something that was trained on ImageNet. Five minutes. Okay, so I'm trying to go fast. I think this is actually a little shorter. Uh, so this is the second uh, application that I want to talk about uh, that kind of addresses the issue of, you know, um, using like off-the-shelf network that are very good at specific imagery and specific tasks but may not actually apply to um, the different problems such as like you know the satellite imagery or if you want some some problems in particle physics um, and this is something that um, is called neural architecture search uh, so this is a it's still an active area the research area that uh, mostly um, coming out of um, Google AI research um, because they have lots and lots of resources so they can do 
a lot of research in this area. Um, and uh, so as we, uh, you know, partner often with, with Google, our entire platform is uh, essentially in the, you know, ecosystem of the Google Cloud Computing. Um, we were offered a trial uh, with, a, with, their, with a new tool that, um, you know, allows you to search for new architectures given a specific problem. And um, so what this does is uh, rather than, uh, you know, using lots and lots of data and trying to find or manually, you know, come up with like uh, architectures or, or even features, uh, it uses a uh, reinforcement learning approach to then find the best network uh, for your problem. Um, and here specifically, we were not uh, searching for uh, any encoder network, but rather uh, the, the feature pyramid part of the network. So if you have a segmentation task, you, you, you mostly have an encoder decoder network. Um, and so in this case, we, we search for the decoder part uh, of, of, the, of the network. Um, and uh, so for this, we, we choose a specific data set, in this case, uh, buildings, um, because we have a large data set there. Um, and then the, uh, the NAS uh, has a specific search space um, that it can, uh, you know, uh, try out different architectures. Um, and so on a high level, what it tries to do is it uses uh, features from your encoder uh, network that you just choose as a backbone um, and then it's able to combine any two of those uh, apply a binary operation and then produce a new feature adding that to the stack of possible features and then go on and times and being a well-defined number uh, and there's just some very basic binary operations that you can do um, and there are two stages in this uh, one uh, where you train um, many, many networks in parallel. So you use uh, many, many TPUs um, to train uh, lots of different versions of networks. Um, and, um, and then you record essentially some metric. In this case, it's the, you know, the, the IOU. Um, and then you inform an RL agent to update the network architecture to then, you know, get better and better and make better uh, architectures. And you only train um, these uh, child networks on a subset of the data for a few epochs. Um, and then in stage two, you pick the top five networks and then do full trainings and, and, and fine tune the architecture. Um, and so here's kind of a, a visualization of what comes out of such a uh, neural ar architecture search. So in a classical FPN, uh, this is how it looks like, right? So you have the features, this is representing the features uh, that, uh, deeper in the network. Eventually, you know, what you do is you up, up sample the lowest feature, you know, somehow concatenate it with the feature in the higher level, up sample and so on, until you get to your, your output, which is usually your, your target, you know, uh, um, uh, your, your target mask. Um, now, in our case, what came out of it looked like this. It's very different. So you can see that it's actually trying to use features from very different levels with, every, with, with different resolutions, because I, as you can imagine, um, it's, not, it's not intuitive that you, know, you, you wanna start with the lowest resolution feature and then uh, feed that up, because in some cases you might wanna uh, combine low resolution features with high resolution features, and then you know, create new features out of that and then feed it into different levels. So it can be, get very complex um, as we can see here. And then, you know, we evaluated those networks and we found that uh, they basically be all our uh, handmade networks that we use for this task. Um, and, and here it's just some, some visuals on, on, on this specific task uh, where you have an input image. This is the target. That's our standard unit uh, that we usually use. Uh, some other network that we use, uh, the efficient and as backbone, and then the two two of the networks that came out of the of the search and just visually you can see that uh, that uh, the quality of the output uh, seems to be much better so sorry for this this is a little fast but uh, I guess we're kind of out of time um, so I'm concluding here um, so yeah so state-of-the-art deep learning architectures are you know 
ever, you know, achieving ever increasing accuracy for computer vision tasks. Um, and, you know, very large data sets make that possible to create more and more complex architectures. Uh, the problem is that, you know, those uh, architectures and data sets are mostly, uh, you know, for natural images and not necessarily for, for any other types of tasks. Um, it, you know, they're not bad. We've definitely shown that we, you can use off-the-shelf network to, to do other types of tasks. But, you know, obviously there is a question of like, it, it, can it be better, you know, is it better? And we've basically shown that uh, you can uh, uh, get better accuracies using, uh, uh, you know, very specific approaches, uh, including, um, you know, specific architectures uh, found for a specific task. And with this, I finish. So if you want to learn more about Descartes Labs, then I suggest you go to these websites or watch this nice uh, video of the one of the Age of AI episodes. Cool. Thanks a lot, Manuel. Very, yeah. very interesting. I think we have time for two, maybe three questions. Okay, uh, I'll start reading the first one. Uh, can CSF be used to co-register S1 and S2 signals? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Yes, in principle, but we haven't tried. <laughs> All right. But that's uh, actually, that's a very, very interesting, uh, it's definitely on, on the back of our minds, you know, once we have time to, you know, dig deeper, that's definitely a very, very interesting application. Yeah. Uh, does, how does training on a TPU compare to GPUs? So it's comparing in terms of setting it up or in terms of the speed and so I, uh, I, I, from the context of the question, unless they would like to add to it, um, I would assume they're getting at speed, but, uh, I am interested personally in setting up a TPU as compared to a GPU. Uh, so yeah. if you want to answer so, both of those. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So TPUs are depending on how you set up the problem and depending on, what your data set looks like and what your architecture mostly looks like. Um, it can get up to, you know, four to 10 times faster than on a GPU, on a single TPU. The advantage of TPUs is that uh, you usually get access, you know, if you spend the appropriate amount of money, uh, you can get access to many, many cores of TPUs. So they come in pots where one pot actually has 2,048 cores. Uh, so you can get, that many if you want to. Uh, mostly the limiting factor is actually feeding data fast enough. Um, so I've done quite a bit of, you know, exploration in, in, with TPUs. Um, and mostly, you know, it's not the speed of, uh, of the training uh, or, you know, it, you know, the limiting factor oftentimes comes down to like how you actually feed data fast enough. Um, and uh, in terms of setting it up, um, it's gotten much easier. It's, it's been a pain uh, a year ago, <laughs> I would say. Uh, it's gotten much easier, in, in especially with uh, TensorFlow 2. Um, it you know, became much easier and it's now very well integrated in AI platform. Um, if you wanna, if you wanna you know, use some like Google resources. Maybe a quick uh, last question. Uh, last question. Uh, what technical frustrations, e.g. bad software packages, did you have in academia that are better in industry and vice versa? With software packages? Um, <clears throat> I mean, in terms of the machine learning stuff, I'm mostly using the same tools. I mean, it's TensorFlow. Um, a lot of people use PyTorch and are saying it's better. I personally haven't really used it much, but um, since TensorFlow 2, it's definitely gotten much better um, uh, and much more similar to PyTorch. But that said, uh, again, it's, it's actually, um, if, if you want to go use Tensor, um, TPUs, then you know, you kind of screw with PyTorch or it's, it's pretty painful to use with PyTorch. Um, so you want to kind of stay in the Google environment there. Uh, to make things uh, simpler. Um, and then, you know, like in terms of like data storage, um, obviously there are two aspects to it. One is how the way we store the data, the geospatial data 
um, which is kind of a totally different, you know, thing than than what we, what we do in, in in particle physics. So you have all these kind of like geo, you know, geospatial data formats uh, like TIFFs and and stuff like that. Um, but when it comes down to like training machine learning algorithm, obviously you you all translate that into a format that um, is fast for training, which you know nowadays uh, it's just TF records that you use, um, especially when when training on TPUs. That's the only way uh, because you have to stream from from cloud storages directly to TPUs because they're not local. Okay. Thanks. Thanks again, Manuel. Yeah. For a very interesting talk.